Right. Uh, some of the uh, older people here may remember late uh, comedian uh, of the left, Le uh, Linda Smith. Uh, well, some people do. Good. And I remember Linda speaking at some SWP event. I don't know if it was Marxism or somewhere else. And really taking the piss out of us, she said, one thing you guys always do is you organise meetings with titles, with questions in them, to which we all know the answer. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, is, is socialism a barrier to human nature? To quote, yeah, we know it's not, otherwise we wouldn't be socialists, you know. Is there a parliamentary road to socialism? No, we know there isn't, otherwise, you know, and so on. But this title... Is there progress in art? It's different. Because um, it, it represents a real question to which I, my guess is that you don't know the answer, that maybe I don't know the answer. Uh, at any rate, it's a question I've been grappling with. And insofar as I'm going to offer certain answers to these, they're ones that I had to work out. I couldn't look them up in Marx or Trotsky or... Tony Cliff or Chris Harmon or whatever. If somebody else has a decisive quote on this question from any of those, then please use. But I found I was wrestling with it uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and grappling with it. Okay, so it's, it, uh, um, I hope you'll come with me uh, as I go through this. The other thing I'm going to say, some people will have been at meetings that I've done on art before. You'll recognise quite a lot of the pictures. Um, there's a reason for that. I want to tell, I want to make the analysis that I'm making and the story, by and large, through pictures drawn from the history of art, but which are familiar to people, rather than, you know, because that makes it easier to construct the argument. So if you think, oh, well, I saw that picture last time, that's the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the reason for it. Next thing I want to say is this, that if we're talking about progress in art, the possibility of or not uh, of that, that involves something else, which is that we, uh, it involves a notion that we can make judgments about some art being better than others. That can be controversial. Who are you to say? And who am I to say? And so on. Oh, I, what I will say on this is that I spoke on this two years ago at Martin, specifically on this question. So if anybody wants to know what I, it's probably out there on YouTube and so on. Uh, uh, and I argued at length how and why we can make judgments about art and really why, in a way, you have to because there's far more out, out there than anybody can look at or preserve and so those decisions are going to be made anyway. And I argued things like this and if you could put the lights down, please, that would be great. We'll see the pictures better. Lovely, lovely, thank you, thank you. Um, I argued, uh, for example, why this landscape by Rubens in... Your National Gallery candy, I probably pass it regularly, is better than David Hockney's similar scene, for example. I think, I think the first one is much better uh, than the, sec the second. I'm a bit obsessed with this sort of thing, so I even think you can argue why an entirely abstract work like Lavender Mist by Jackson Pollock is better than this one by an imitator of his uh, much later. Anyway, I'm assuming that we can make those kind of judgments about some is better than others. But now, let's have a quick glance at some things from the history of art. Okay. We'll start here, near the beginning, not quite at the beginning, but near the beginning, the caves of Flasco, 17,000 uh, uh, BCE, before the Christian era. There, hunter-gatherers, right, uh, uh, in the Paleolithic period, painting animals, and whatever theory you have about it, they're painting them, because in some way or other, that's what they hunted and, uh, 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 and lived on. Okay, next one. Rembrandt, Slaughter Dogs, 1655. Oh, Damien Hurst, Mother and Child Divided, 1955. Okay, three works of art from 17,000 years ago, from the 17th century, and pretty modern. Can you say we're seeing progress here? One's getting better, we're getting better, and Damien Hurst is better than the case of Lascaux? Maybe, maybe not. 
Um, Picasso went to the caves of Lascaux and said we'd learn nothing. You know, they, <laughs> he likes saying things like that. But uh, better than Rembrandt? You know, I don't know. But you can't see any overall progress in the same way that if you showed, uh, you know, in the sense that if you showed a bow and arrow or a flintstone in a modern machine, you could say, oh, I'll come back to, to that point. Yeah, another, another example. War, the depiction of war. Medieval work, Paolo Uccello, just at the beginning of the development of perspective, the Battle of San Romano. Uh, <coughs> it, again, in the National Gallery, although the, the painting comes from Florence, but in, in Candy's National Gallery. Right? Uh, <laughs> Another one we knit. Yeah. <laughs> Stop any sense of humour that people might be having. Uh, Goya, from the... Uh, Peninsula War from the war when the, the Spain invaded was invaded by the French armies and his Disasters of War series. Horrifying, of course. Still shocking to see. Most famously, Picasso's Guernica in 1937 through to Liechtenstein's Wham in 1963. They're all interesting works in different ways. They all have different things about them and they all represent war in very different ways but can you say we're progressing obviously the weapons of war have progressed if that's the right word for it enormously over this pe this this period of time all the way through to nuclear weapons and so on uh, 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 and the horrific stuff but is the art getting better it's a way of posing the question or oh, look at this I, I'm deliberately not saying what that is. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> right. Does anybody know what I've just shown you? Somebody may. Go, go for it. Sorry? Uh, well, no, but near. Brancusi. Well done. Which is the Brancusi? This? No, the other one. The second one. And the first one? Yeah, very good. Yeah, Cy Cycladic arts from the, the Cyclades Islands. About 2,500 years ago. All right? And then Brancusi, terribly similar. All right? And... But I think probably the highest selling, or whatever they call it, you know, uh, uh, sculptor of the 20th century, uh, Brancusi. Yeah, work that is incredibly similar. There's a very interesting book I have here, if time would permit, I'd show you lots of it, called Modern, uh, Modern and, Pri uh, and Primitive Art. And I tried this before just to show that. Um, that's from Etruscan art, you know pre the Roman Empire, that's geochromatic. I don't know if people can see that. And the, the whole book is full of things <coughs> like that, how you can get an African sculpture uh, from Gabon and a 20th, 20th century Spanish work and so on, this sort of thing, like that. So that's my starting point for the problem. And the problem uh, that uh, uh, exists there is Right. As Marxists, we would argue, and rightly, I think, that art is part of the superstructure of society and that that superstructure is shaped and conditioned by the economic base. Okay? But then, if that's so, would you expect the art, while in some sense or another, not mechanically, not automatically, but over centuries, reflecting the development of the base, it should be getting better because the base is developing, is it not? So that's a problem. Now, interestingly, I said you couldn't look the answer up in Marx. Steve Marx does write something about this. <coughs> uh, this is from the introduction to the Grundrisse. The uneven development of material production relative to, for example, artistic development in general, 
the, this is in note form, I'm afraid. The concept of progress not to be conceived in the usual abstractness. Uh, in the case of the arts, it is well known that certain periods of their flowering are out of all proportion to the general development of society, hence also to the material foundation, the skeletal structure, as it were, its organisation. For example, the Greeks, compared to the moderns, are also Shakespeare. He means, compare the Greeks to the moderns, he thought the Greeks were better, or that Shakespeare was a greater writer than uh, modern writers, despite the development uh, 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 and so on. It is even recognised that certain forms of art, for example the epic, Homer, can no longer be produced in their world epoch-making classical stature as soon as the production of art as such begins. Uh, uh, and so on. And he, I, I won't uh, read it all, but he, I note the, the last sentence, he comes up with an argument as to why we still like them. Why we still like Greek art, which he was, and Greek literature, which he was very fond of. But he says, the difficulty lies not in understanding that Greek arts and epic are bound up with certain forms of social development. The difficulty is they still afford us artistic pleasure and that in a certain respect they count as a norm and as an unattainable model. Now, <coughs> this often happens with Marx. You get very profound insights when he's actually doing something else. He's writing about economics and money and commodities and so on. So he doesn't pursue the question of Greek art and the development of art. But you get a clue. And I took that as a clue. And Try to move on from, from there. Now, what I want to argue is here at this point is that yes, art does reflect sometimes very closely developments in the economic, what you could call the economic base of society, uh, all right, or the base, but it reflects something else. If you talk about what is the economic base of society, <coughs> you're talking in the first instance about forces and relations of production. But when you look at what art tends to reflect, it barely reflects the development of the forces of production. What it tends to reflect overwhelmingly is the relations of production and the social relations that those condition. The relations between men and women, between uh, lords and peasants, between kings and their subjects, between uh, the people and nature, uh, uh, you know, the sky, the mountains, the rivers, and so on. How people, you know, what is the relationship between a lord and the lord's servant? Uh, how are people relating to one another? What do they, all of that is the stuff of art, in one form or another, uh, uh, and so on. Very little is it that this machine has got better than another machine, and this tool has got better than another tool. And so, if you then talk about reflecting or expressing or responding to changes in the relations of production and the social relations of the society, then, then the question of progress is very differently posed, isn't it? Because yes, we see advances. It's an advance when we get beyond slavery, but we have wage slavery. Right? It is an advance, capitalism is an advance on feudalism, yes, but capitalism produces more monstrous inequality than feudalism ever could conceive of. Capitalism is an advance on feudalism in certain respects, yes, but capitalism threatens the future survival of humanity through its destruction of the environment and so on. So that when we're talking about how social relations develop between people, in many ways they get more unequal, more exploitative, more alienated. That's also a challenge. So we have a much more complex picture than we do if we just look at the de uh, development of technology. Now what art does, and what great art does, is particular is express those changing social relations. So if you look at Michelangelo's David, it is a response to a, a, a rising of the people of Florence in which they kicked out um, their banker ruler, the banker rulers, the Medicis, and so But what it expresses, what it expresses symbolically is the new social relations developing in the Renaissance. I'll come back to, uh, uh, to, to that in a minute. That's, that's what gives the way. It's nothing to do with the development of the forces of production. Quite the uh, opposite. You know, all David has is a sling. <laughs> so, but it represents that struggle against Goliath and so on sim symbolically. Rembrandt, the sampling officials of the Draper's Guild in 1650. Uh, 1662. It represents the social change, the new 
form of social relations that have emerged as a result uh, of the, du the Dutch Revolt. It's an extremely incisive representation of who those people were, the rising Dutch bourgeoisie, what, uh, how they related to people, from the point of view of one of the people they're inspecting, one of the people they're assessing, and so on. That's what's going on there. And so on. we find this uh, repeatedly, even all the way up to Tracy M in and, and my bed. What is this about? Is it about a bed technique? No, it is about, the, it encapsulates in a physical object a statement about social relations, in particular about the situation of women, their relation to uh, housework, their, the notion of uh, a woman who would be regarded as a slut, uh, uh, how people judge each other, what kind of real lives people live, and so on. It's all about social life. You can like it or not like it. It's good or not, but that's what it, that is uh, 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 what, is it, what, what it is about. Now, okay. So, at this point, you would say, what John is arguing is there's no progress in art. Not quite. Not quite my opinion. <laughs> right, because one thing we do find, though, is that there are certain periods of flowering of art. There are certain periods when it is clear there is an enrichment, there are, if you like, golden ages. You will, you know, if I were to ask you, you there's one you would all come up with it. I mean, golden ages when there is a particularly intense period of creativity and development of art. The most obvious one, of course, is the Renaissance, right? Uh, of that which and some other things, the material conditions which produce it, and so on. Engels wrote uh, uh, brilliantly in the introduction to the dialectics of nature. But in the Renaissance, sorry, missing, missing a point, I forgot about that. Uh, in the Renaissance, around, if you were to look at, just if you were to kind of draw a line through it, uh, at 1500, you would find a period when you got, in a very tiny part of the world, Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, Bellini, and Titian, all at work as the kind of peaks of the thing. You broaden it out a bit, you have an almost endless list of great <coughs> artists. Right. Uh, Masaccio, Mantegna, Uccello, Piero della Francesca, uh, and so on, uh, 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 and so forth. You could make that list much, much longer. It's an extraordinarily uh, intense uh, period. Another period. The Dutch Republic. Right. Uh, you have a period, a moment in time, when you have Franz Hals, Rembrandt as the supreme figure, Vermeer, Van Rysdale, De Hoek, and then all, you know, still great, seen as great masters, all operating in this very small part of the world, essentially Amsterdam uh, and uh, Harlem and so on around there. Uh, uh, and then again, a large number of uh, slightly lesser figures, but still outstanding artists uh, uh, at the same time. Another period that's exceptionally rich. Now you could date this a bit earlier, carry it on a bit, but this period, of France, the second half of the 19th uh, century, you have an extraordinary sequence of major figures. Corbett. Manet, Monet, Pizarro, the, or, you know, Degas, Renoir, the Impressionist, the Post-Impressionist, Sura, Van Gogh, Cezanne, and so on, through to Picasso, to Matisse, to Leger, uh, to Duchamp, uh, 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 and so on. And then, you know, actually, you could extend these list, a whole host of uh, secondary figures. Of course, not all of these were French, but they were concentrated. The, the leading artists who were not French came to Paris because that was where it was at. So you get someone like Van Gogh coming to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Paris and to France and then at other places. So concentrated in quite a small place, this extraordinary flowering of art. Okay. Right, now, if we say there are periods when art flowers, there are also periods when it declines. Uh, uh, that, that, that follows... Um, Hang on, just one second. <coughs> Sorry. I have a horrible feeling that I clicked on the wrong version of my, my talk here and that I haven't got quite all the slides I intended, but we'll see. Right. There are periods when it flourishes, periods when it declines. If there are 
And so then can we see moments in time when there is some, something you can discern as progress? Right? I would say there is. Right? And if we look here, I'm going to talk here about the development of the Renaissance, just to show you what I mean. Right. We talk, we're talking Florence, uh, end of the 13th, beginning of the 14th century. The start of the uh, process that leads from kind of purely medieval Byzantine art up to the development of the High Renaissance. Already, if you take these two figures, Cimabue and Giotto, and you look at those two works, you can see the beginnings of a development. Right? That is, we've got the same subject, but perspective, three-dimensional representation is increasing in the Giotto from what it is in the Cimab Cimabue. Uh, plus the representation of plasticity, of the sculptural quality of, if you like, of human figures is increasing. It's, uh, it's developed. They're becoming more individualized rather than just represented iconically. That, you can see that already in uh, these two works. Move on a bit. Mantegna, and you can see much more complex work developing. We have a crucifixion here with a significant development in perspective, depth, and so on, and in the complexity of the composition, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. Then you move on to the height of the Renaissance, uh, to, uh, to Leonardo da Vinci, and here you see the... Um, Perspective has now become much more subtle, much greater sense of, uh, of distance, but also this extraordinary kind of harmony of the forms and the uh, fluidity of uh, the representation. So, so there's a, you see in all of this a real development taking place between then uh, and uh, the, the High Renaissance around, fi around, 15, uh, around 1500. Similarly, if you look at... You see a similar development in Dutch art. You can see a very important and great painting, the Arlolfini Wedding, 1434. The Master of Antwerp, 1525. Through Bathsheba in the 16th century, 1594. Through to the Dutch Republic it, uh, itself, and what I would call the high point, which you see. No, no, we are seeing similar stuff. Look at the the Arnolfini wedding through to the wedding depicted by Rembrandt. There's a development. There's a humanization. There's an increased complexity in the rendering of human feeling. There's also a development in the technique of painting, in the sense that Rembrandt is more impressionistic, less kind of uh, uh, purely naturalistic in a way but it produces an extreme uh, naturalistic effect. Again, you have the contrast between that representation of Bathsheba, the Bible story of Bathsheba, and this one in Rembrandt. Again, there is an enormous development in the depth, subtlety, and complexity uh, 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 of the painting. Okay, so that's just illustrating what I think if you, if you go to the somewhere like the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and go around, go through it, you can see this on the walls, this development as, it, as you come up uh, to uh, the middle uh, uh, of the 17th century. Okay, so in that sense, there seems to be some progress. If there's progress, though, there's also decline. This is simple. This is a list of Dutch painters from the 18th century. We've moved on. 17th century... We have Vermeer, Rysdale, Rembrandt, Franz Hals, all these great artists. I, I, I don't want to be passionizing, but I read through all of these uh, lists of Dutch papers. I've never heard of any of them. I don't know. They, they come, no, you know, when I look at the 17th century artists, all these images flood uh, uh, into my mind. Uh, the, the night watch, the representation, the regents, uh, the laughing cavalier, the uh, girl with the pearl earring, you know, you name it. Hundreds of images come to mind. 18th century, nothing. I don't, doesn't, doesn't. So uh, uh, it's not a quantitative thing. There is 
as, I, as far as I'm aware, no real great art produced in 18th century uh, 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 there. So there is progress and there is regression. So my answer to my question, um, is there progress in art, is one word in a sense, sometimes <laughs> there is progress in, <laughs> in art. But that of course then uh, raises you're, you're, I'm going to be less than that. You've got, you've got, <laughs> I was covering myself. But sometimes... No, that's how long you've had. Yeah, great. Um, okay, that's, that's fine, that's fine. I'll be fine. Um, the, the, so sometimes there is progress. This raises a lot of other questions, doesn't it? What kind of conditions produce progress? What does it look like, progress in art? Um, what are the dynamics of it? Right, those are some questions to, to start with, and then the really big one, which is where are we at today? Uh, now, I'm not going to be able to give full, on, I'm not going to try and give full answers to, to all of those, because that's another, uh, uh, another meeting, and then I would be in trouble with the chair. But let me, let me just say uh, on uh, the, the first, what conditions? Now, you, we cannot be mechanical about this. I don't think you can say, anybody can spell out exactly, you have to make a concrete analysis of what were the conditions in each case. But certain things do sort of stand out from the record, I think. One is that it usually happens in cities. Now, I don't mean that doesn't give, there are not exceptions to that. Of course there are. I don't mean by that that, you know, Van Gogh didn't produce great work painting in Arles or Cezanne, you know, down in the, the south of France or some, something like that. I don't mean that. But the central folks, look, you know, whether you talk about Athens or you talk about Venice, Florence and Rome, or you talk about Amsterdam, or you talk about Berlin, or you talk about Paris, or you talk about New York after the Second World War and so on, it tends to be concentrated in cities. And it tends to be for reasons that are fairly obvious, in cities where there's a lot of money sloshing around. There's a, there is a layer of people with surplus that they can support the arts. They can, you know, the Medici's, for, uh, for example, or the Guggenheim's, or, you know, God forbid, the Sachi's or whatever. But, uh, you know, there are a layer of such people willing to invest and support it because art is a costly business. It, 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 it's, it, it's a more costly business than writing poems or writing music or whatever. You need a certain infrastructure for it. You need somewhere to house it, you need somewhere else. So that is necessary. But there's something that's more interesting than just it being in cities so there's a lot of money around, I think. And that is that. Broadly speaking, whether you're talking about ancient Greece or the Renaissance or the Dutch Republic or France in the, uh, the 19th century and so on, I think you're, there's a, a very general association between the development of art and the development of a class, a rising class, which is expanding uh, human horizons. Right. Now, I put... I, 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 I could say a revolutionary class. Sometimes they are revolutionary. Uh, often they're revolutionary in some broad sense. But I don't want to establish a mechanical relationship and say you have a revolutionary movement, a revolution, and that produces great art. Unfortunately, that's too oversimplified. But you have the rise of a class like the bourgeoisie up to a certain point. Um, you see this in Italy, up to a certain point in Italy, and you can see the cutoff of it, which is clearly uh, attacking, critiquing, going beyond the existing conservative worldview of uh, uh, the, the church and their view of looking at things, developing in science, developing in art, and opening up human horizons for people. You see the same thing happening in North, uh, Northern Europe a uh, hundred years later with the Dutch Republic, you see it to some extent in Elizabethan England and in Shakespeare and in uh, Milton and so on and the poetry of, uh, of that time. So I think, so that's the, the second thing. I think you see it in France with both a continuing rise of the bourgeoisie and simultaneously kind of parallel with this, 
the beginnings of the rise of the working class, as you see in 1848 with Corbet and the Paris Commune and so on. The, con the convergence or the parallelism of those two things are producing optimistic, revolutionary, utopian perspectives for, for people. And out of this, you get a great flourishing uh, 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 of art. Then you get periods like in Italy after the Renaissance when suddenly that, those options are closed down and gradually the art declines. So as you go from you know, the high points of Leonardo and Michelangelo and Titian and so on, you have some stuff with uh, Caravaggio and so on, but by the time you get to the end of the 18th century, you're left with just very little Panova or, or something, and then after that, almost nothing, until things pe uh, uh, pick up again. So I do think you, you, you see that. The other uh, point I want to make about this is slightly different one, which is that, uh, but it's relevant to talking about today, I think that as art develops, and as it, if you like, progresses, there's also often an element of loss as well. It's moving forward, but it's moving forward in one direction and something else is, is being lost, and then sometimes the next wave of art counters that. I think this is particularly so in the modern period. Let me just try and explain what I mean. If we look at uh, France and say we take Manet's Olympia, one of the great works of the 19th century, as a, as, as a starting point. I'm not talking here about the subject matter, by the way. This is an extremely interesting painting from that point of view, but I'm not talking about I'm talking about uh, how, how, uh, what kind of representation. We have a representation here which emphasizes, among other things, form. The form of uh, 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 Olympia. Right. What comes after, immediately after Manet, is Impressionism, Monet. There's now a shift to emphasizing light effects. In the process, and brilliantly so, like with these, all these paintings, he did lots of paintings of Rouen Cathedral at different, uh, different times of day, with different light effects, and how, how it changed, how it looked. Magnificent. But in the process of shifting towards a representation of light effects, form, in the sense in which it existed under Manet, gets lost a bit. What comes immediately after then, uh, and, and very quickly, is then a reversion to form, to an emphasis on form. Um, sorry, that's another example of an Im Impressionist painting where the emphasis is on light effects. Um, uh, Pizarro's Boulevard Montmartre by night. Then you get a return to form in an attempt by Georges Seurat, uh, another one from the National Gallery, uh, um, where you get an attempt to retain the light effects as used by, developed by the Impressionists, and Monet in particular, with a re-emphasis on form as you would find it in, uh, in Manet. So there's a movement for something is lost and attempts to um, to uh, regain it. Then, sorry, clicking on too fast. Then you get a kind of division in the development of modern art. Um, there's a book by Herbert Reed in which he takes the two artists he sees as foundational in this, Cezanne and Van Gogh, and say that from Cezanne you get a development of an art of structure and with, uh, like in his numerous paintings of Mont Saint Victoire, exploring the, the structure of the, uh, uh, of, of the mountain and of nature. And in Van Gogh, in which you get uh, uh, an art of expression, of feelings. Now, you don't have to buy the whole of things like that, but you see my point, you get these art developing in different ways. One, perhaps, su sacrifices structure for expression of feeling. Uh, the other concentrates on structure and so on. So you get this gain a lot. Gain and loss going on at the same time. Now, that takes us to where we're at now, uh, which, as I say, should be a whole other meeting, but just say this. Um, in the, the 21st century, art has been advanced art, or art that considers itself advanced, the cutting edge, has been dominated by what's called the social turn. Socially engaged art. Radical art. Um, art, uh, but also art which looks to be collective, 
which looks to be outside the gallery, engaging with uh, communities, often engaging people, participating, and it's been through various stages. There was relational aesthetics, participatory uh, uh, art, uh, <coughs> and so on. Interesting book called Strike Art. It's about art after Occupy, the Occupy movement in America, which many artists were involved in thinking about that and how it is, uh, 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 has developed. You know, the most famous person who sort of represents this is, to some extent, is Banksy, but it's moved far beyond this to kind of uh, work that's so very hard to show pictures of. Um, one famous one uh, in this camera was Jeremy Della, who produced a reenactment of the Battle of Augury from the, from the miners' strike. He actually got people together to re to reenact the uh, uh, the battle, and this is a mo very much more recent thing uh, in in America, um, where uh, it's called half the. This this is complex. You, to understand what's going on here, you have to read about it. You can't see it. I mean, they they wrote about it as follows. Uh, in April two thousand fourteen, artist volunteers created an exhibition and interactive events for women artists in China and the US at Luxon Academy of Fine Arts in China, <laughs> speeding up, uh, entitled Half the Sky, Intersections in Social Practice Art, uh, 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 and so on. So they staged a kind of happening in the 60s, uh, uh, an event with people in which people came together uh, and did this. People, are, artists are trying to do this all over the place uh, in one way or another. In so doing, right, you can, we can applaud all this, uh, uh, as a socially engaged art, an art that draws people into it, an art that relates to working class communities sometimes and so on, art that moves beyond uh, the gallery system, uh, 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 which is, you know, police, the, the gates of which are kept by uh, the, the high priests of culture and so on. All of that is good. But there's also something which in the examples that I'm showing you, it's clear we're losing. You can see it even there. I, I'm all for Banksy, I'm not, you know, he's done great stuff. But if you compare a Banksy with a Titian, there's something lost in the sense of uh, that, kind, the handling of the paint, the representation of the figure, the creation of a, if you like, to use the word, a beautiful work of art. And in this, right, in the Battle of Orgreave, the half the sky, and in the socially engaged art, there's arguably a loss of aesthetics, of the sense of something, of making an object which is expressive, which is powerful, which is well constructed, which is beautiful, and which remains. Now you can say, well, I'm not interested in all of that, and I'm, I'm not, I don't, I never believe in art that, you know, you say to people, you have to do this or you have to do that. But I do say that one of the driving forces behind visual art over the millennia is the desire of people to make interesting, amazing, beautiful, surviving objects. So insofar as you stop doing that, that opens territory up. So maybe that, you know, where are we going from here? Maybe somebody will find a way of producing socially engaged art which also results in uh, 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 important objects. I don't know. What I'm trying to say is that what we see, when we don't see mechanical progress, but we see developments in one way or another. I think, and this will be the last thing I'll say, that I think when you look at the state of the world today and what is coming down the road, one of the huge challenges which art will have to relate to in one way or another over the next decades will be the environmental crisis, the climate change, and so on. And the question will be posed, how would you relate to that as an artist? So that, I think, is an interesting question in if art is able to rise to that challenge and meet that. So that's, that's some of my argument, and I'll, uh, I'll stop there and we can discuss. OK. Thank you. Yeah, I, one of the things is, fairly obvious when you're going through your presentation that it's very Eurocentric art. I'm just wondering if the same argument can be applied to other regions of the world, whether you're talking about you know, China and Japan and the art that lies in China and Japan and South America and all the arts and how that is actually... Whether that sort of similar sort of arguments could be put forward to that 
that would be, I think, also an interesting part of this because I'm not sure. It, because of things like China, basically, it was a, a feudal society up until fairly late. Did that impact on the, the art and how it's produced? Because I've been to Beijing, went to the museum, and I'm afraid calligraphy leaves me cold, really. So, <laughs> if we can have an expansion on that, that would be great. Thank you. After you, it's the woman at the back there. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank John very much. That was a fascinating. Uh, introduction to the question, which is an enormous question, a very important question for us to consider. I just want to add uh, perhaps a point that John might want to consider, and that you talked about the flowering of great moments of art, which I absolutely agree with. I wonder whether one element in this is a question of contradiction. Um, I'm thinking of the way in which I don't know really enough about Rembrandt, but I know more about literature. But Rembrandt is obviously part of that richness of the Dutch Republic, but also in conflict with some of his patrons, as I understand it, there was a sort of tension there. Um, and the other question to do with that is, if you look at literature, which I do know... Oh, sorry. If you look at literature, for example, you've got the same thing about towns. I'm thinking of Shakespeare, for example, uh, in Elizabethan and Jacobean London. There's no, there's no painting, or very little by way of painting. There is theatre, which is much cheaper and much less dependent on the status quo because it's more accessible to the people. Uh, people, the, the apprentices can go along to it. So one of the things you might say about Shakespeare as this great moment, this flowering of theatre, is that not necessarily it's going to be the visual arts, it may be other forms of art become more central, because I don't think there's much painting going on in that period. Uh, in Britain, for example, I may be wrong, but I don't think there's much going on there, but there is this enormous flowering of the theatre. And it does come out of a contradiction, it strikes me, which is between there is the rising classes, the new bourgeoisie and so on and so forth, which it, it, it is a, an emancipatory element, but also, of course, it's a restriction. This is the new bourgeois order, and you get a lot of that, strikes me, in Shakespeare, that kind of contradiction. So is contradiction part of this notion of the flowering? And when those contradictions get flattened, you get a decline in that art. That's a question I really wanted to put to you, John. After you, the, the man at the back. I, I, I just wanted to, to, to ask a question really about accessibility because it seemed to me when you were talking about socially engaged art, the first thing that struck me was actually how socially engaging Renaissance art was. For the first time, ordinary people went to church, which is where they saw this stuff mostly, although some of it was in private houses and actually saw things like Giotto's The Virgin beginning to look like something that resembled them, an ordinary woman, you know, who had flesh and blood and all the rest of it, rather than the sort of iconic Byzantine figure. And that was quite an important thing for people. For the first time, they could see the people in their town. It might have been the dignitaries, but these were real people who reflected their lives. So therefore, it was very <coughs> accessible for people, and that was the whole point of it, to actually tell the stories of Christ and all the rest of it. And it strikes me, when you talked to, to me today about socially engaged art, um, I kind of thought to myself, well, it might be socially engaged, but who is it socially engaging with, actually? Because, I mean, if you want to talk about somebody like Jeremy Della, if I went back to my little art group in town or my relatives or people I talk to, I bet you none of them have heard of him. Actually, never mind never seeing any of his work. Whereas they would know what a Van Gogh is, because I think you've got a point, you know, about the fact that making things, making beautiful things it's, it's not just art, it might be jewellery it might be anything, it's a really fundamental part of human existence so even the first people who made beautiful um, arrowheads had a real, they were functional but they had a real eye to actually make something that was beautiful in their own terms and I think to me this socially engaged art although it might be socially engaged I mean my question is who is it socially engaging because I actually think it's not very accessible to lots of people but the other question is is um, it, <laughs> progressive mm, I, I mean I'm not sure about the whole argument at all really because I I, I, it's, it's a real muddle for me but I think it just seems to me that actually it's not progressive although it's socially engaged which sounds a contradiction because most ordinary people have no access to it and very little understanding of it and I think there, there's a mismatch somewhere and the other thing, the last quick question schools curriculums at the minute art is just going it's just going it's not people kids one of my friends, Charles, she's seven. She gets half an hour of craft and art every two weeks. There's 
So it seems to me that the ruling class are actually quite happy with people like Jeremy Della, but not very happy with my kids being able to learn how to make beautiful things and actually express themselves in their schools. And I think that tells you something about the postmodern, uh, what's the word, neoliberal ruling class that we've got at the minute, who are quite happy with a load of the stuff that's produced because it doesn't really actually help. It doesn't actually make, encourage us to be anything different, but it suits them because it's not particularly exciting in some ways. But anyway, so it's a bit muddled. Can somebody have their hand up at the back and I can't, couldn't see who it was? Okay, they're not coming forward. So after you have been... Yeah, I mean, just someone mentioned something about a non-European art. I think there is... There is a talk about Hosukai, the famous Japanese have to speak up a bit, it's uh, noisy. painter who made pictures of, uh, I think, well, some of the most beautiful pictures of waves. So I, I think there is some coverage of that in Marxism. Uh, the point, question I wanted to raise is, uh, you, you mentioned, so, you know, in art, uh, you can make aesthetic judgments about, you know, paintings, that sort of stuff that Banksy produces and what, ha what went on 300 years before. But I think that sort of thing is inevitable. If you consider, for instance, the French Impressionists, they were painting at a time when photography was coming. And when, once, the, once we invented photography, art could never be the same again because that technology just changed how artists saw their work. And that was in inevitable, I think. Um, I think also the, the point about um, you know, revolutionary periods I agree with you, but I think it's also correct to mention there's always exceptions to a rule. And you could consider, for instance, the Baroque was not a very progressive movement as, uh, because it was coming out of the Counter-Reformation, which was a, a response to the, refer you know, the, 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 the bourgeois revolutions in Northern Europe, a reactionary force, but at the same time was able to produce some, um, sometimes some great art like, for instance, Caravaggio. If you go to Rome, you will uh, see in the chapel some beautiful examples of Caravaggio's paintings. And you will see, for instance, examples of Renaissance paintings. I went to see a, a, a chapel in Rome and you, had, saw, you could see his work compared to some other work. And, and what was interesting about Caravaggio is when he was producing his stuff, he was in, involved in a lot of conflict. He needed some bishops to actually sponsor him because a lot of people didn't like the stuff he was producing. They, did, they found it just too, um, uh, just too weird, all this dark, bright, you know, this use of colour. It, it shocked a lot of people. Uh, and I think also the other point is to mention is, is, is that great art can also, it depends on, on sort of, um, uh, you know, contingent events. For instance, the, the right people being in the right place at the right time. For, so I remember I was involved in Occupy and I remember we were at a meeting and someone said um, a group of artists would like to put an art installation outside St Paul's Churchyard. I don't know who it was. I said yeah yeah that's fine and then later I found it was Banksy produces this Monopoly board installation uh, there which was you know I don't know if anyone has a photograph of it. I wish I made a picture of it. But it produces this you know, installation of a Monopoly board which was only could have been produced in that situation at that moment, so that it wouldn't have had any meaning otherwise. So I think things like that matter. Uh, John, have you got any comment at all to make about sequential art storytelling, i.e. comic strip art? which synthesizes visual art with storytelling. And we did see a couple of panels of a comic strip on the, on the display there before. Thanks. I, I just wanted to raise this question about accessibility of art because uh, John talked about money people and what's happened in the last couple of decades is the neoliberal elite, and they are the elite around the world, have pumped a huge amount of money into museums, uh, into spaces, right across the world. And so even across the UK, you know, there's been a revamping of galleries. You know, you go to any major city or town, there'll be a, a project uh, that's happened, and, and, and you see that. But they've also seen huge numbers of people actually visiting Right? Huge numbers of them. You would have thought 
that with the economic crises, you know, the banking crises, the numbers would have gone down. The numbers haven't gone down, right? And National Gallery charging 18 quid a shot uh, for special exhibitions. But there's a conflict as well where art workers, there is a kind of uh, argument talking, uh, and an industry developing, uh, where art workers are saying, we need more accessibility, don't charge more. That coffee costs too much. Uh, you know, that postcard too much, that book costs too much, we need to allow more access, schools need to come in, uh, we need more artists to be involved in it. And there are more artists involved around the world. Biennials, you name it, across the world are rising up. So there is that kind of conflict in terms of, you know, there are forces of development, there are buildings, you know, going up. Right? And money being pumped in. You know, look at the Middle East, you know, Doha, mm. you name it. All the major architects go there, build us things. Uh, you know, the French have, you know, packed up in Paris and gone off to the Middle East to build all the museums. So there is a big, uh, you know, convulsion taking place in the art world at this particular moment to say, that, one, there is money in art, but also we, you know, there is somehow we need to give access to artists in kind of different forms. So I, I, I think we, you know, I'm not saying this is a definitive, but there is an argument about accessibility uh, 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 and that, and I don't think we can kind of say, uh, say that. And an and artist as well, you know, I think in a major form now, you go to any kind of major, apart from the big exhibitions, you know, the big money-making exhibitions, there'll be social interventions. We want to get more people to come and interact with our art. And you see that in all the kind of the programs with the Tate and everywhere else. So I, you know, there, there is an issue that the majority still can't get there. We know that art has been uh, demolished by Michael Gove and all those bigots that we see around, around the world. But at the same time, there is another element of struggle taking place to say, actually, art needs to be made accessible for everyone. And I think at this particular moment, and I don't know whether John has any reflection, the artists have come together around the refugee crisis, right? Uh, I mean, uh, his stuff is fantastic, absolutely fantastic in terms of, you know, that big boat people have seen, but also the film that, uh, that's been produced. But also the question is, you know, the film has become the new art. Uh, in, in that kind of way as well. So we have to think about those kind of developments as well. Uh, so the kind of the visual arts that John has talked about. And also when someone said, Steve Norris asked about non-Western art, actually, finally, there are rooms opening up where people are saying, we need to re-examine that. You know, the British Museum doesn't have anything British in there because everything is looted. You know, <laughs> you know, it is the, you know, you name it, it's named after every continent, isn't it? The Africa Room, the Middle East Room, da da da, da nothing there. So, uh, you know, there is a reevaluation taking place as well. And I think we need to get stuck into that uh, about that reevaluation uh, in, in terms of, of, of art. Nothing is definitive. Oh, hi, this is by way of an advert, and in case you don't get round to reading your socials review before you leave London, just down the road in Russell Square, the Wiener Library has an exhibition about um, degenerate art. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, the explosion of modernism and expressionism and the absolutely beautiful art and objects that we see from that, well, someone else had a different idea of progress. So I'm going to ask an obvious question here, but I like John talking about these things. So I'm going to ask John, why was Hitler so concerned to have a massive exhibition of what he called degenerate art? Um, yeah, just a quick um, thing. I sort of got thinking about it during in the discussion when people were saying some of the things about kind of the impact neoliberalism had has has on art. I think this is kind of relevant to that. Um, if not, I apologise. But we had a slightly weird experience in Manchester where I used to where I lived um, until quite recently, a few months ago, because there was this statue of Frederick Engels that was discovered in a barn in Ukraine. And they decided to put it back and it was like this like Soviet era Stalinist statue of Engels. 
And they decided to put it back together and bring it to Manchester and put it up sort of in the city centre. And it was weird because everybody went to look at it and you couldn't quite, you could see where they hadn't quite managed to sort of clean off the nationalist graffiti and sort of like little, little bits of blue and yellow paint all over it. But the bit of Manchester that they put it in was this really kind of, it was weird because it, it was in this sort of trendier bit of Manchester where you had this really overpriced bar and sort of really overpriced cinema and a fancy pizza place and then just this massive Soviet era statue of Engels. <laughs> and you were just going, okay, this is quite this is quite strange because you had all these kind of quite sort of trendy middle class people coming to look at the statue and going, oh, isn't this interesting? And sort of completely ignoring, I don't know how well I'm going to put this, like, like the context of when this was like made, what it's actually of why people why people are interested, why people were interested in it. I thought it was quite interesting. It was quite a weird, in a weird way, in sort of quite a weird little way in Manchester. It's like neoliberalism had taken this thing that, to, that's kind of symbolised like, you know, like stylism and stuff like that and just sort of turned it into this like interesting little curiosity. It was very strange. But anyway. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a member of Yorkshire Sculpture Park, and uh, that's a great place for anybody who's not been. Uh, and there's lots of great works there. Uh, Wayways Tree, Iron Tree, and, and yeah, the Zodiac works there recently. So that's brilliant, brilliant stuff. Uh, the thing is, uh, families can go, working class families can go for £8 a day parking, and then they can you know, be around the fantastic park, lots of trees, ponds, it's a brilliant place. Uh, the thing about it is, though, when their works of art are for sale too, and quite often you'll get a few squiggles in a frame for like 800 quid, which, you know, working class families are just not going to buy. Although, I do think working class people love to have art in their homes, original stuff. <coughs> and like myself, they buy original work from eBay. Now, uh, a lot of it is rep sort of reproducing uh, other works that have already been created in that style. And quite often, you know, they claim to be by Picasso or even, you know, sort of lowering it by on eBay. But I'm, I'm pretty sure they're not genuine. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but a lot of the other stuff which claims to be by artists, I'm not sure that's genuine either, but it's hard to tell because I don't trust these dealers. I mean, I'm sure they're all swindlers and they'll, they'll say anything, won't they? The fantastic descriptions of paintings, <coughs> tempt you in. And you think, ooh, great, I might have that. I bet I can get it for 200 quid. Uh, and sure enough around that that price you can well there's some really good stuff and what's popular i found is abstract work you, you know lots of colors in different shapes and sizes and people really like that and you think well why why you know why, why is it about abstract work that they like and i think it's a lot to do with alienation because i've got one which is cubes and dots of this mannequin and it's all about alienation it's about them being being manipulated like a puppet uh, and I think people can relate to that kind of puppet feeling that they have in life and, and the cubes that we're in and being pulled about and not understanding what's happening. Anyway, so, so, so I'm not saying, you know, people, I'm just saying perhaps, you know, that, yeah, that's the point. Working class people have access to art on that cheap price that they can afford and it's original work, whether it's genuine or not, in a way, it don't really matter, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, it's it just a question, really. Um, if you look at the Russian Revolution, there was an explosion of art after that. And I just wondered if John would say something a bit about that, because you also saw the explosion, and also you saw the repression with Stalinism and the, and the horrible restriction on art. And I wondered if that sort of is, is a good example to, to comment on. Um, just to... I'm going back to when I went to art college, um, back in 1973, 72. And it was Hornsey College of Art. <coughs> and they had... Too late. Sorry? <laughs> and they had... Um, two years before I went there, they had uh, occupations. And that followed on from Paris 68 and all that was happening. And my experience, when I then went on to do um, another three years at Goldsmiths, was the... You could, we went to loads and loads of different performances, which was very much about trying to engage people. And it, you got this sense in which people were trying to do work, which was they didn't want to be co-opted. It was like a hangover from 68. 68 didn't lead to the, the breakthrough that some loads of people wanted. And it seemed to me that the work was... Be, was reflecting that, and it seems to me as well that that has been going on for all this time, almost 50 years. And so 
constantly you see the kind of performance art, the socially engaged arts. It's been going on since 1970s. And, um, and it seems that there's, that there's that kind of... On the other hand, what I'd like to raise is the, every town, every area is now doing open up studios with hundreds and hundreds of artists are just opening up their houses, their garages, their studios, or whatever. And it's, that has developed over the, over the last 20, 30 years. And th that is all part of gen a genuine kind of movement of people really wanting involvement with art. And you can see that. You go to the Tate Modern, for Christ's sake, you can hardly move. There's so many people going, and, and the kind of things that they do there that involve so many people. So it, there, there's lots of contradictions, but it does seem that we're stuck because that fight is still going on from 68. And there hasn't been a resolution to it. And it seems like partly there's the, 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 a lot of the performance art, a lot of the socially engaged art, not wanting to be co-opted by the establishment um, is, is still carrying on and there, there hasn't been an answer yet. And I do, and I do get that sense in which, um, you know, when you talk about periods of art, somebody mentioned about, Malev for instance, Malevich in the Russian Revolution, what a fantastic breakthrough he did and then you look at what he did when start basically with, with the Stalinism and his work became this awful, alienated, robotic type, um, figurative thing, people, which kind of reflected that awful defeat that had happened. Sorry, I'm not very mobile at the moment. No, no worries. A um, couple of points. Kainholz, the um, for people who don't know Kainholz, so I'll just describe going into one of his um, pieces. Be very neutral. This piece, I walked into it, and I sat down at this uh, table and got a Coke out of the machine. The cafe, the parasol putting into was based on a very famous photo of Ayima of the American um, soldiers planting the American flag there. So this parallel that behind me was an updated up to that very day of the number of dead. In, oh, sorry, number of wars since the Second World War. I found it very powerful. He also had another um, tableau, if you like, of this car. And he was going into the car, old American automobile, and all the faces were replaced by clock faces. <coughs> so he had to think about people, times, how they're controlling lives. Right. One other last another point. Alexander Calder, very good engineer, producing these fantastic mobiles. Let's move around. And then you go and see these, <laughs> and you just puff on one of the mobiles. They're so well engineered, and he was an engineer, that you can get all these. And he did a. Obviously, it's a complex. I'll just mention one thing else about performance art. I remember one in London at the Oval um, and it was reenactment or it's about Chicago and it's a very famous scene where people got banned and brutal, brutalised by the cops and the rest of it. And at the end of this performance from the artwork, we got driven out by the theatre because they exploded a, a smoke grenade in the actual audience, hit us with paint sprays and drove us out into the oval. And then we had to go across the other side. And as, this was, as we got on the other side, this double-decker bus came along the road. 
and the people were looking at what the fuck is going on, <laughs> you know. So that was one. The other one was Albert Hunt in Bradford, who devised the whole of Bradford into a giant chessboard and moved a giant chess piece around the city. And the final one is people, uh, people, um, people, whatever it was. They took over, uh, took over with the residents, uh, tenants, permission. This whole um, council estate, and this whole thing was turned into an event. It's fantastic, and everyone was involved. I think these are valuable things. Right? <laughs> Plus, we really ought to talk about 68 and the Art College Revolt. <laughs> so it's completely missing from the talk on 68 earlier. No, please do come if you can, just because it's easier for people at the back to hear you if you're facing that. Uh, I think uh, people become to be a Platonist when we talk about art, and I think it's time to refine, redefine what is art, just like Deleuze do in movie. He wrote two books about uh, movie, uh, cinema one and cinema two, and uh, I think modern art is extremely dependent, uh, bordering about uh, of art. But this doesn't mean the basic question of art is changed because the ba I think the basic question about art is what is human and uh, what is the relationship between human and the universe. And I think uh, the skills is uh, developed and, uh, and uh, the technology is development, but this not means uh, there is a progress in art. I saw the topic of today's lecture. I thought it would analyze its art progressing in today's world. I didn't think it would uh, still go through the history. And another quick point is uh, maybe I'm being ridiculous, but I think because it says it's, uh, I feel a bit arrogant because it's like it's art progress, just art. And then I went to lecture if all still about all Western art. I know maybe it's what you specialized in, but I think maybe something can be improved in this topic because art is very general. And then I want it's all Western art, Western art pouring in my face. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's, that's it. Thank so. you. Thank you. Right. Um, right. First, uh, first off, let me uh, apologise about the Eurocentrism thing, but also defend myself a little bit. Uh, if you think about the examples I gave uh, throughout that, it wasn't entirely, there was a lot of it, it was uh, 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 broader than actually just the European art tradition, but, right, this is just a question of knowledge and scale and what's possible. I was attempting, and I do in this, to kind of grapple with general problems and illustrate them. It's beyond me and I guess probably beyond almost everybody, to do that for Chinese art, Japanese art, African art, Central American art, and the whole history and know the whole of those things and fit them into 40 minutes. Or so. I don't know enough uh, to do it, to present any kind of coherent. I'm not even sure it could be done. You know, I, I think uh, uh, that it's incredibly difficult. It's also incredibly difficult even to do it for where things are at right now, because that's a vast, problem uh, uh, um, uh, overall and any kind of attempt to talk about it involves an uh, 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 enormous, uh, if you like, selection. So that's just apologies about that but also it, it, just to say how, how incredibly difficult it would be to do that in a comprehensive way. Um, the, uh, uh, it doesn't mean, however, if the argument is basically correct that it wouldn't apply at least at a general level to uh, 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 other societies. Right, now, um, the first point that was raised uh, uh, from Gareth Jenkins about contradiction, I think he's absolutely right. And I think, of course, contradiction, in a sense, is always going to be central to any development. I think, uh, I think the whole 
uh, of art, and especially this becomes a more, as you, as you reach the capitalist era, art develops through contradictions all the time. And contradictions between the artist and the society they are in, or the rulers of that society, contradictions among the artists. Artists define themselves often in, co uh, in contradiction to other artists, so I think the whole process is uh, contradictory. When the example, I, I mean, I don't know, but I, I did, have written a little book about Rembrandt, which is about how Rembrandt is a product of the Dutch Revolt and Dutch capitalist society, but also how he develops in contradiction to it, in a kind of primitive, instinctive anti-capitalism, which he couldn't give ideological form to because it's the 17th century and so on. But but it, but you, you you see that, so that it, uh, in there, and I think that's absolutely true. The problem that Gareth raised about how come he alluded to how come we've all got this great art. Uh, uh, in uh, the Dutch Republic and in England you have the great literature at the time is what I've given considerable thought to over the years. I was in Amsterdam just recently uh, and you walk through the art gallery and then you come to a park nearby, it's called Vondel Park. Vondel Park is the name given to the major Dutch poets of the 17th century and nobody's heard of them. Uh, uh, right, Vondel was the Dutch Shakespeare uh, whereas you know, there is no English Rembrandt. I, now, that's all sorts of, but it's, the, the, we do have these contradictions all the time. And look, I just uh, appeal to people, we're, we're tr I'm trying to tease out generalizations, to make generalizations about what is an extraordinarily complex uh, thing. And the, the, the comrade who said there are always exceptions to every rule and so on is absolutely right. There are going to be all sorts of uh, uh, e exceptions all, all, all the way uh, 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 along. Now, um, the uh, question that came, came up um, uh, about um, ac accessibility, this is in itself an extremely complicated question, but I would just caution against certain things. And that is the notion that when we look back at past art, so you look back at something, sorry, very familiar, like that, well, that's obviously accessible. Well, if you think, if you thought that landscape painting ought to look like Claude Lorraine or John Constable, you looked at that for the first time, you thought he was mad. And it wasn't accessible at all. And Van Gogh, far from being accessible in 1889, probably sold about one painting in his life. And nobody's on. It's become accessible. Often what seemed completely inaccessible then becomes through familiarity accessible to people in different forms, you know, through mechanical reproduction that Walter Benjamin went on and, uh, 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 about and so on. This is a continually changing and shifting thing. Now, I thought Rahul spoke very well about the contradiction with, uh, in the galleries. And this runs right the way through art. It's not just something new. Uh, right. The commissioning and ownership of visual art, and this is different in literature and music, but the commissioning and ownership of visual art is very concentrated in a wealthy elite. Right? You can go back to the Medicis in Florence, or look at the New York art galleries, or... Uh, the Gargosians, or, you know, in the, 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 the British tradition through the National Gallery and the British Museum and so on. It's, however you look, it's, it's very much because you're talking about individual objects that become valued highly, which need taken care of in spaces which, um, you know, ordinary people can't fit in their homes. You can't put Michelangelo's David in your front room uh, uh, and so on. The Sistine Chapel, you can paint the Sistine Chapel, but who controlled the Sistine Chapel? You know, the popes and so on. So this is not new, this has always been so. At the same time, at the same time as that, you also have a popular element to it, and this is continually shifting. Michelangelo's David was carried through the streets of Florence, and it represented a popular revolt, right, and was put on display in the central square and so on. So you've got that contradiction going all, all, all the time, and we still uh, uh, live with it uh, to, today. 
you know, what sculptures you put in Trafalgar Square, what you put in O'Connell Street in Dublin, or, 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 or whatever. Now, it, it, in a class-divided society, this cannot actually be resolved, right? The ruling ideas in society are the ideas of the ruling class, says Marx, and the ruling culture uh, of society is the culture of the ruling class. In some sense, they're going to dominate it. You can't resolve that while you have a class-divided society. Artists will, by their nature, try and rebel against this, and good luck to them, but they will not be able to change that by themselves. To change that, you have to change the society. To change that, you need, uh, 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 you need a revolution. That doesn't mean to say that we don't support at all progressive attempts within that we do. On the question of the socially engaged art, it's accessible to some people. A lot of people have never heard of it. A lot of people participate in it or see something like Peter says, that's great, I like that. But often it doesn't leave a physical object behind that you can then put in the museum or put in the art book. You know, you can't have a Thames and Hudson so, or, or put on your wall. So there's a gain and a loss in, in, in that sort of thing. It doesn't mean, I think, that we should reject it. The argument about, well, the ruling class are quite happy with it. Well, yes, and generally speaking, the bourgeoisie, it's not always so, I'll come to Hitler in a minute, not always so, but generally speaking, in bourgeois democracies, the ruling class figures we can co-opt art. And we can let the artists play, we'll have a few people who will specialise in it, or we'll have members of the ruling class who's, I mean, this, I, I'm not being sexist here, there, and they will give it to their wives to specialise in it, you know, the, the Guggenheims and the, uh, 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 and the Rockefellers and these sorts of people, you know. That we'll let them, they will buy it up and then we'll control it. That's their general, their general strategy. This doesn't mean to say that the art, the artists want to live, they want to survive, they need to buy paint, they need to buy work, they, co they cooperate with this to some extent. It doesn't mean to say their art is no good by the virtue of the fact that the, the ruling class tolerates it or... Or, 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 or co-opted uh, and so on. Even Banksy, from this point of view, has been co-opted and his work is being sold for hundreds of thousands and so on. But, uh, 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 that happens. And if the social engaged artists are trying to move beyond that, well, uh, 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 fine. Now, um, I also think... Uh, oh, God, there were so many questions that it's very difficult to construct <laughs> uh, answers to them all uh, in a form. I, let me say, there are... Um, the, the question about Hitler and degenerate art and so on, there are exceptions to this, um, and you get some regimes that decide that art is threatening to them and they want to smash it. Now, let me link this. I think that the question about the Russian Revolution and the question about Hitler are connected here. I think that what happens, and it happens in the art and it happens in the politics, is that there is actually an international revolutionary movement and we shouldn't see this being an island has taught me this in particular uh, what happens in each one country is often seen as if it's part of that history of that country and then it's separate so the Russian revolution is seen as a Russian thing the Irish revolution is seen as an Irish thing but actually they were inter inter interlinked uh, and part of a revolutionary way, and the counter-revolution was international. There was a counter-revolution in Ireland, there was a counter-revolution in Russia, and there was a counter-revolution in Germany. And that counter-revolution in all those three countries suppressed critical art. Stalin suppressed the revolutionary art of, uh, you know, the constructivists and Malevich and so on. Hitler su suppressed modernism, which he saw as a threat, and, uh, uh, and so on. And in Ireland, they banned James Joyce, and, uh, uh, and we, we did it on a small scale. But they, these are actually linked phenomena of a counter-revolution uh, after the international revolutionary wave around the end of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the First World War. So I, I think that's a different uh, a kind of di different pers perspective on it. Um, lots of the individual points... Uh, uh, I, I like. Um, just say about um, there was a reference to Ai Weiwei and his refugee art, uh, and to the in, in relation to uh, to this, um, we were quite close in Dublin to getting Ai Weiwei. We hoped to speak. We thought we had a, at an anti-racism conference, but he didn't come, which was uh, annoying. But uh, 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 
Chinese comrade told me that in China people think Ai Weiwei is like the Irish think about Bono. Uh, he said, and that really does deflate. I don't know. He, he's sitting there at the back. Of kind of, uh, now, I don't know if, that's, if he's right about that, but they see him as a bit of a kind of international celebrity sellout. So this sometimes you, you get the, these things, but I think, uh, anyway, I think he's produced uh, 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 some interesting art. Um, I think you get all these kind of um, different contradictions when you're, when you're dealing with that, and we should try and avoid being dogmatic. Generally speaking, art is a good thing to be encouraged, and, uh, uh, and so on. And from that point of view, I loved the point about uh, the Engels statue. Whatever, you know, the Taking a Soviet-style statue of uh, Engels, it may not be as good as Brancusi or Henry Moore, I don't know, but sticking it in Manchester, I'm all for that. That would get entirely, uh, yeah, <laughs> entirely uh, my vote. Uh, and I agree in a, a kind of way. I'd, I'm not sure about the Platonism and so on, but I agree that the fundamental things about when we're talking about, we're talking about one aspect of the relationship between between human beings and between human beings and nature, mediated by human labour. That's what it, when I, t I talk about visual art, because again, not because I'm anti poetry or anti literature or anti music and so on, you can't talk about everything. Um, it's all of it is part of that, but in relation to visual art, painting, sculpture, and its derivatives and so on, it's very much about what human beings as, cre uh, as, uh, as creators, as makers, produce with their hands and their brains to, uh, together. It's an embodiment in that respect of, of human uh, labour. And that sets, I think, art in contradiction to, uh, to, uh, to in contradiction to all the uh, alienation, exploitation of class society. It's continually co-opted, continually brought in, but it continually renews itself in contradiction. And therefore, I think, to the question, is there progress in it? I think there is progress when, at the broadest level, I don't mean just there was a struggle, but at the broadest level, that new horizons as an expansion in human consciousness about our relationship to the world uh, 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 and to nature and to each other. I think in, in that sense, that's the, uh, the essence of my argument. It's at a very uh, broad level, but when it does so, it is, I think, um, uh, I, I think it is of benefit to all human beings and of benefit to the struggle for socialism. And I think the struggle for socialism gains from this, and I think the struggle for socialism will open up new horizons for this uh, 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 in the future. If we manage to move beyond the uh, exploitation, oppression and alienation of class society, then we're in new territory. And I think, quoting Trotsky, you know, beyond that, new, new horizons, new levels will be reached. We don't know where we will get from, uh, from there. But I'm quite sure that in the struggle, art and the, and the struggle, uh, for human liberation go go hand in hand. <laughs>